Welcome to another episode of This Week in Legal Blogging, the show in which we talk with leading bloggers from across the legal industry. My name is Bob Ambrogi. I write the blog Law Sites and have the podcast on legal innovation called Law Next. This program is presented by LexBlog. A number of months now, and you can go back and look at all of our recordings with bloggers on YouTube at youtube.com slash lexblog. And this show is also available in podcast form if, if you don't want to look at our pretty faces. Uh, and you can find that at Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever else uh, fine, pond, fine podcasts are, are found. Our guest today is Charles Sarton. He is a partner in the Dallas office of the law firm Gray Reed, where he leads the firm's energy litigation practice group. And he is author of the blog. Glad to be here. Nice to see you. Uh, I, I, uh, how, how, I, I, it looks like you're in your office. Have you been, have things been getting back to normal for you at all? Or are you still kind of uh, dividing your time between uh, home and work or? We're, we're still home and work. We're about to uh, try 50% in the office uh, getting next week and see how that works. Yeah. How is in the middle, you know, not too aggressive, not too conservative. Yeah. Yeah. How many people in your office uh, on a, in a normal time? Well, we have 75 lawyers here, 75 in Houston oh. and a few, and then several in Waco. So we, but we've got 75. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Did you did it was the transition for you to uh, to working from home when when uh, all hell broke loose earlier this year? Uh, how, did, how did that work out okay for you, or do you have any problems? Or it it worked out okay. Our um, our staff really did a good job of preparing us. Um, our COO is a former Accenture um, uh, consultant, so he plan his life is planning. He planned for us really well and. It's just, it's it's less efficient. It's just less efficient if everybody's not in the same office. And and I think we did a good job of overcoming it. Had a couple of Zoom here, bunch of Zoom hearings, a Zoom trial or two. You can get it done if you have to, yep. but it's, yeah. it's not the opportune way to do it. Yeah. Uh, so Charles, before we talk about your blog, tell us about your practice. Well, I'm an oil and gas litigator. Um, really more general commercial litigator with a focus uh, on energy, which in Texas is primarily oil and gas. Uh, I do some healthcare as well, but we represent mostly, but not exclusively producers, operators, uh, midstream companies, investors, um, promoters, you know, the, the kind of operator, the run of the mill oil and gas company and midstream company. Yeah. And is that what you've been doing your entire career, or did you get into that uh, at some point later? No, pretty much. Uh, I started with Sony Oil Company, so I kind of understood the business as an in-house lawyer and then decided that litigation was more fun than drafting contracts. So I yeah. drifted off into the into the litigation, and that's what I really like. I, I like yeah. it better. Yeah. What, has there been uh, an impact on the oil and gas industry from the uh, pandemic? Uh, and, and more specifically, has there been an impact on, on your practice and your clients? Um, boy, yes. Um, <laughs> well, what it's done is it drove demand significantly down. It drove prices significantly. Demand for oil and gas? Yes. Yeah. Uh, commodity prices. Yeah. Um, so they're... There have been massive layoffs. Um, uh, no deals are being done for our transactional guys. Uh, the litigate, our bankruptcy practice is about as busy is busier than it's ever been in in yeah. my experience. Um, the companies that we represent and the individuals that we represent don't really, more often than not, don't see litigation as a profit center. So um, they're not really inclined to, and, and the courts are closed. Yeah. So right. Litigation has slowed down. Yeah. And clients are not inclined to want to spend a lot of money right now in litigation. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so does that suggest that the the uh, flow of litigation matters has kind of uh, slowed a little bit uh, over the past uh, six months, eight months or so? I would I would say it's slower. It, it's right. it's slow. it's not dead. It's just a little slow. Yeah. And it will yeah. it will pick up. Yeah. We don't know when the price picks up. Yeah. Well. Evidently, something's been going on because uh, I've been reading your blog and, and uh, you seem to have no shortage of stuff to be writing about. <laughs> yeah, the, it's it's Texas is a is a busy state and uh, yeah. it's, it's a huge state. So you've got a lot of cases. I belong to the Louisiana bar and I will do Louisiana yeah. from time and time. And, and we'll do Pennsylvania and Oklahoma and other places as well. But Texas just has a lot of courts and a lot of oil and gas people, and a lot of oil and gas litigation. Yeah. Uh, so the title of your blog is Energy and the Law. Um, tell me about what your focus is. What are you writing about there? So so what we do, and I have help from some of my associates and my colleagues, our target is busy oil and gas professionals, both busy in-house counsel. Uh, I don't mind, you know, my competition reading the blog. We we try to we we and then and then say landmen, uh, engineers, oil and gas professionals who want a rather um, brief description of what it might have gone on in a case that isn't focused so much on the trial itself, which is what we do, rules of civil procedure and the like, but really, you know, kind of the issues that might that that a oil and gas professional might be dealing with. Um, you know, suits with their royalty owners, operators, non-operators, the kind of day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, we take a, you know, we'll take a view on 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 climate change and and fracking and government regulation from time to time. Uh, we take a little more position uh, as an advocate on those topics than we do on straight case reporting. So we don't try to make them too long. Uh, some law firms have very long, very detailed. We, that's good for them, but that's that's not what we really want to offer. We can we can do that if we need to. If, if a client calls us, we're, we're able and willing to do it. But that's not the purpose for the blog. And so it sounds like you're you're if I understand what you're saying, you're targeting the blog really at those who are in the oil and gas industry on on the business side, on the industry side, not other lawyers practicing in the field necessarily. That's I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, does that suggest then that the kinds of matters that you're going to report on, the kinds of cases that you're going to report on are cases that have a business bent to them in some way? Yes. Yeah. And we write about things that we know about. Yeah. Words. Uh, uh, we don't get off into FERC regulations and 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 the. Uh, you know the Paris Climate Accord and, and and what might be going on in Kazakhstan. Yeah, because that's yeah. not what we do, and that's yeah. not what we know. Right. Uh, it's uh, it, it's it's funny because it, it, you mentioned one of the words you mentioned in answering the question is a landman. I have to admit that uh, I, I'm in Massachusetts, and until probably five years ago, I had never heard that term and had no idea what it was. And I met another lawyer who's in the uh, works in oil and gas in Texas. And uh, she she used that phrase. But uh, if there's others out there like me who have no idea what a landman is, what is a landman? A landman. And we haven't gotten to the point where we feel like we have to refer to certain of them as land women. OK, or the land person <laughs> and land part, the, the, the people of, of of both genders in our business seem to be okay with the word land man, but it, it, it can be different things in different businesses. Uh, a land man might be checking title in the courthouse to see who owns the minerals that they want to lease. The land man might be negotiating with, um, with, with land owners, mineral owners. You know, we're the only country in the world where, where that has private ownership of minerals. So unlike any other country that I know of, when you when you want to drill a well, you're dealing with a with your, you're dealing with a private landowner, unless you're drilling on federal land. Um, landmen will negotiate with other companies. That landmen kind of turn in sometimes into business development officers who basically do deals with other other oil and gas companies. 
And when do, when do the lawyers get involved there after the negotiations have, are done and, and uh, the deal breaks down in some way? Well, um, a lot of landmen uh, pride themselves on their knowledge of the law. So uh, sometimes we don't get involved at all. Before somebody drills a well, they're going to get a title examiner, do a title. If it goes south, uh, they're going to get we litigators to have to help out. Um, and then it, it's a the oil and gas law is 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 really is pretty complicated, and sometimes there are questions, especially of title, that a non-lawyer can't answer. So you got to get a lawyer to, to to address that. So there, lawyers can be involved at pretty much any stage in the in the in the process, really. Charles, I was looking back uh, through your blog, and it it looks to me like you started it in 2012, unless you moved it from another location that you're doing before. How did you get started with it? What what motivated you to to want to start a blog? Um, 2012 is when we started. So um, my my blogging muse uh, is a gentleman named Cardell Parvin. Oh, I know Cardell. I don't know if you know Cardell, but yeah, I do. I yeah. Okay, well, Cardell was a practicing lawyer. Then he turned his business into one of helping other lawyers make rain. And we were involved in a little program with Cardell. And Cardell says, if you really want to get your expertise out, you need to blog. And Cardell and I talked about it for two years. And every time I talked to Cardell, I'd say, yeah, I got to start a blog. I got to start a blog. And Carl Cardell always said, if you're going to do this because you have to do it, It'll never last. Do it because you you want to do it. And I did a couple and did a couple more, and there it is, you know. And it's 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 it 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 helps me keep up on the law, um, because I, I'm more of a, a I'm, I'm a litigator. It, it helps me to keep involved and up on the the substantive oil and gas law as opposed to the rules of the civil procedure, and um, it's fun. And what started doing it, Cardell says, you got to do it, you know, regularly. And we pretty much turn out one a week. Yeah. Was it, was it difficult for you uh, starting out to get into that rhythm uh, or that routine of doing it? Or, or did you kind of adapt to it naturally? Uh, it, it seemed to come pretty naturally. It's, it's easier to do when you're not in the middle of a trial for darn sure. Sometimes right. yep. Off. But sometimes you can, well, it's impossible to do if you're in the middle of a trial, but, right. you know, I have a lot of good colleagues here who can help me out. And uh, and it's really, a, it is a group effort. It's a firm-wide effort. Yeah. And and did you have uh, the idea for what you want to do with the blog right from the start, or has that changed at all uh, as you've been doing it over the years? No, it pretty much, um, it pretty much is now what it was always uh, conceived to be, which is, a uh, uh, short um, review on a weekly basis for, for busy professionals who want to understand the gist of, of a lawsuit result without having to study it. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be 1,500 words. It's going to be three to 500, 600. Uh, you can read it quickly. Um, the other thing Cordell taught me is to don't bury the lead. So uh, I, I certainly try Good for Cordell. Reader know what it's about when they get when they get started. So if they say this doesn't apply to me, they move on. I'm trying to help. Yeah. yeah. I'm always curious. Did you have any kind of a writing background other than as a lawyer? Did you worked in journalism at all or anything like that before you were doing the blog? No. Which is the other thing Cardell helped with because um, it's what I learned is writing for a general audience, trying to be a bit of an entertainer as opposed to a purveyor of knowledge is not the same as writing for a judge. When you've got six, when you've got six hundred words, you have to be very much, you know, you know, we're we're talking Ernest Hemingway here. We're not talking William Faulkner, okay? It, it, <laughs> you know, it has to be really to the point because they're not going to stay around too often, uh, for too long if if you get too wordy. Yeah, it, it looks to me from from reading your blog that you also like to put. A little personality into it, even a little humor into it, if I if I if I put it that way. Is that is that fair to say? Well, I try. I, I don't know what my what readers think about it, but I try. And then, of course, you notice my musical interludes, right? Yes. That, you know, um, I was a DJ for a while, not 
joint, but as a hobby. So I, I haven't ever left that. So I enjoy a little musical and, and I try to, I try to make it pertinent to the topic sometimes. Um, you know, it doesn't always work. And anybody who, if they didn't know who, didn't look at my picture and didn't know who or, or how old I was, they would probably figure it out by the <laughs> that, that it's on the blog. Yeah, is it is it mostly a particular genre that your musical in, interludes are coming out no. of? Oh, it's 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 mostly no, it's 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 the music that I like. It's I'm from Louisiana, lots of Louisiana music, you know. And you can't go wrong with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Almond Brothers, you know. A little jazz every once in a while, blues. Yep. I, I, so. Hopefully I'm educating my audience about that as well, because I can, we can get pretty obscure sometimes. Yeah. So what about the uh, developing a readership for your blog? Did you do anything in particular to um, try and get it started, to try and get people to know about it and, and pay attention to it? Or did you just kind of let it happen more uh, naturally? Um, we pretty much let it happen. I mean, we'll, we'll, uh, I, I pro the firm promotes it. Um, I'm frankly not sure how we do it, but I know the firm does. That, you know, <laughs> our marketing people do try to get it out there uh, as, as much as they can, but I promote it. I've always said, you know, I'll, I'll, it's on the back of my business card. I'll give my business card and say, tune into my blog. Uh, you know, some do, some don't. Uh, and of course we get readership by, by Google searches. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm inclined to think that some people, once they kind of, once they see it's there, they might they might start checking on it, you know, more frequently to see what what's up. And I'm not the only one out there, so I'm sure they. There 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 are others that I'm sure they do the same thing yeah. with. So Cordell Parvin told you you need to do this to build up your uh, your uh, profile in in your practice area. Uh, was he right or did he mislead you? He was right. He was right. What, what's been the impact? Well, um, I'm not going to say that I have had too many clients. I can think of a few because of one, one reading of the blog. But, but people, acquaintances that I know in the business will – tell me sometime, hey, I read your blog, that was interesting. Somebody will call me and want to talk about it. Um, so it's a matter, what it does is it, it, it there are a lot of indirect uh, results of, of kind of marketing, if you will, business development. You're not always able to say where a particular, you know, client or piece of business came from, but it, right. what it does is it puts, my and the firm's expertise out there. I mean, every law firm is, you know, what a law firm our size is, you know, big firm results, small firm price. We're proactive. We collaborate with our clients. We put our clients first. Every law firm says some variation of that. But I think what people want to, they want, they want subject matter expertise. So my view is if we, if we can, display our subject matter expertise we're 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 far we're better off for it and it, it 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 helps me but it also helps it helps the firm my other partners who do transactions and litigation and and things like that right so it's not like somebody reads your blog and clicks a button and hires you but it's it's the uh, because of your blog, your profile is greater, your expertise is out there for people to see, uh, and that uh, leads directly or indirectly to uh, to business. Yes. And an example, I d I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. Um, I, I have appeared in bankruptcy court with our bankruptcy lawyers, but that's hot right now. And there, there are certain topics that are that are really hot. I'll, I'll prevail on my bankruptcy colleagues you write me an article, you're going to be a co-author. This helps you as much as it helps me and it helps the firm. Yeah. So it's a platform for other lawyers in the firm as well. Yeah. Do you get um, responses from your readers or do you engage at all with your readers? Not, not in the, in the mode of coming, you know, calling you saying, I want to hire you, but 
do they respond to your post in any way or do you do you get any follow up from them about specific posts that you write? The not not really. Um, sometimes I mean, infrequently uh, I get I got the most pushback um, by uh, a what I would call um, rabid fringe environmentalist who wanted to invite me uh, out to see a well that she said was poisoning the atmosphere and I respectfully declined. <laughs> I didn't think there was going to be anything there that was going to help me. Yeah. Or, or help her for that matter. Yeah. Excuse me while I plug in my computer. It went off. Okay. There. That's better. Okay. We don't want to run out of gas here. Yeah. I've, I've done that. I forgot to plug in my computer sometimes. Um, you said that you said early on that you uh, sometimes take a position of advocacy around certain issues. You mentioned fracking, for example. Um, we, you know, how do you decide when, how to draw the line around that? How do you decide how how much of an advocate to be around an issue without fearing, you know, maybe alienating potential clients or or whatever else? I mean, what, where are where are you on fracking? What what kinds of positions have you taken on that? Um, what I try to do. What I try to do is to point out what I call fringe environmental environmentalist efforts to not tell the truth about fracking and about methane emissions and about whether we should be in the in, in, in the Paris climate agreement and what I think about what, what and it's, it reflects what I think about that and let's say the Green New Deal. But I don't uh, put my own opinion out there because I am not an expert on any of those topics I just mentioned. But but I can go out in, into the you know into the journalism world and 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 the, and the advocacy world and the economist world and I can find I can find points of view that are very much more um, well developed than I could ever come up with. And I, it's all. Not only one sided either. I, I, you know, they're, I, I'm not. I don't try to be totally one sided. If you look at Forbes magazine, they they have individual writers who express their own opinions. They're all over the place. Right. On oil, coal, wind, solar. Um, so, so I, I, I don't. I'm not too much of an advocate on on. Uh, although we do it sometimes on the position. A court of appeal or the Supreme Court of Texas might take on a case, um, unless we think it's. And then I wouldn't do that on my own. I would have partners who agree with me because these opinions are my own. But if you put them on your law firm's website, disclaimer or not, it becomes the opinion of your law firm in the eyes of some people. So I am careful about that. Yeah. And and I I don't think the people that someone like like me would offend are, uh, are the kind of people that are going to hire us in the first place. Yep. Um, right. And I'm not saying that all environmentalists are crazy. I'm not saying that at all. There's a very responsible, you know, environmental defense fund. There are others that are, that are solid, good, well-intentioned and have a point of view. So you mentioned that uh, there are a couple of associates, I think, in, in, in your firm who who also help with the blog. I, I forget whether you said other other partners as well. But um, at, at, I don't know at what point you started to bring in others to contribute to the blog. But at, at that point, did you dispense words of wisdom to them? Did you give them any thoughts or, or instruction on what you thought they should do to make the blog work, uh, how to write a blog post or what topics to pick? Um. Well, you'll notice of late we have a, a young associate here in the in the Dallas office, Rusty Tucker, and and Rusty, it, we we have an energy industry team, say title lawyers, deal lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers, litigators who talk about ener energy industry topics from time to time, so that that we all have kind of a broader knowledge that we might have just our own practice area. So Rusty is in charge of at this point, and we, we'll he'll hand it off to somebody eventually. He finds cases, summarizes them, and sends them out to the team. 
So I say, okay, Rusty, we're going to take this 1,200 word summary for the lawyers, and you and I together are going to turn it into 500 words in a block. Give me your, your best shot. And then we work together, and you know, again, trying to to teach, trying to. It, it's not natural for lawyers to write. I personally don't think so, unless they have a journalism background, as you, as you suggested, to write for a general audience. They all want to write for judges and other lawyers. Right. Yep. So that's, so hopefully I'm leading by example. Uh, yeah. And and I have a number of years on him, so I'm not sure he'd tell me if I weren't, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but so that's, so that I was going to ask you about sort of your routine about how you find things to write about. So Rusty is helping you find the cases that are that are uh, that are coming down at any given time and and uh, at least bring drawing up the short list of things you may want to be talking about and then and writing some of them up and then together you work on writing uh condensing that down into a post putting your imprimatur uh, I, I think on it uh, if you want to call it that uh, is that is that yeah. kind of the routine yeah. I think so. And then, and then what we'll do is we'll get off into issues sometimes that have nothing to do with, with case law, for example. Um, the, the big issue now that that is is something oil and gas companies are going to have to get, get comfortable with is ESG. So um, we have an accountant, a, a, a economist group that we work with, Value Scope. Uh, they wrote an article on ESG. So I said, I, I re reached out to, to the professional there and I, and I, I they sent it to us, uh, and I said, this would be interesting as a topic that oil and gas professionals need to know about, even if they don't think they need to know about it. So I attached his long paper. He did a summary. We published it. Nothing to do with law, but something that the uh, the energy industry needs to pay attention to. Yeah. Uh, we, we spoke earlier about the issue of whether clients came to your firm or to you because of the blog, and uh, that's that's always a hard thing to uh, pinpoint, even even when it does happen. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, have there been other opportunities that have come to you because of the blog, whether it be speaking or or uh, you know being quoted in the media or or uh, any of those kinds of things? Yes, um, all of that um, all of that has happened. Inadvertently, it's also uh, provided an opportunity for my opponents on two occasions to try to use the blog against me. Is that right? <laughs> when he says, well, Sartan, you said this in the blog, and now you're saying something else. Well, yeah, you know, not the same situation. So it, it so if one exposes his knowledge, his media, his, his, his understanding to the broader world, his, his, his opinions, any statement you make could be thrown back at you by uh, an opportunistic opponent. It's never affected, to my knowledge, it's never affected the outcome of a lawsuit. Yeah. And of course, it's entirely, I mean, it. it I, I've, I've heard that before, but I mean, it, it always seems to me, for, I mean, first of all, you're writing on your blog uh, in, the, in the moment about a case or something that, that came down without the perhaps critical analysis that you might have as you're actually representing a, a client in a litigation matter. Uh, and, uh, and of course, as you say, the, the facts and the circumstances can, can vary greatly. And, uh, uh, you know, so I, I don't know, I don't know how far that actually gets you. I've never heard of anybody having much success with that. I've heard of that I, happening before though. I don't think they do. So I say what I say and, and, and I'm comfortable saying that, saying what I yeah. say. Yeah. I, I have been in situations uh, in which I have been uh, talking in, in either in a somewhat adversarial situation with a lawyer who suddenly says something like, I read your blog and I love it. And it's like suddenly the whole dynamic gets kind of thrown off in the room <laughs> and your client's kind of looking at you like, what's what's going on there? But uh, but nothing like what you described. It gives you a, a, a gives you an appearance. It's not an appearance, but of a person who is knowledgeable of, about the subject matter. And if yeah. you're handling an oil and gas case for a client and somebody says, I like your, my opponent says, I like your blog, it can't hurt. No, it's not gonna hurt, your, not gonna hurt for you and your client, that's for sure. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if you, uh, 
you know, given your experience now and, and what blogging has meant for your career, what, what you've kind of learned about it that you might offer as advice to other people who are getting started or, or thinking about blogging, uh, early stages of it. So, so you have to write about something that you know about. You have to find an audience that wants to hear the topic that you know about. And you have to do it regularly. And the hard part is getting into it enough to be committed to doing it regularly. So many blogs, Colin could probably tell us this, but so many blogs get started and kind of, I get the impression, kind of run out of gas. Yeah. And then some other blogs are outstanding, but they haven't found quite the audience that they need to find. So they don't have a wide, re they're great blogs, but they don't have a wide readership. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. Right. Yeah. Although, you know, again, I, I, do you think that the, do you think that the numbers of readers matter or, or who's reading the blog matters? Um, if you know what I mean by the difference there. Um, well, I would like to have both. In other words, yeah. <laughs> of every independent oil and gas producer and his and his CFO and his headland reading my blog, headland man reading my blog. Uh, so, and then as far as numbers, um, I seem because of the topics we write about, I get Lex Blogs analytics. I see that people in the business. I, I don't know how many of them is, but you know, it's it's people in the business of reading the blog. It's, you know, now in terms of who's reading it, that's important because a lot of, uh, I have a occasion from time to time to get a call or an email from a, from a landowner or a mineral owner. And they say, you look like you wrote a good blog article on, on, uh, you know, nuisances by compressor stations. And I can't help them. But so that, you know, that, that's not the kind of work that I do. I, we typically represent midstreams and not, not landowners, not, not yeah. landowners, but so that's a person, a lot of that readership wouldn't do us in, in terms of business development, wouldn't do us that much good. I don't mind being a public service, but so you, you'd like as much of both as you could get Yeah. your target readership and large numbers. Right. Yeah, in, by large numbers, I was kind of thinking to myself. I mean, they, they, if if you're getting large numbers, but those large numbers have nothing to do with your target readership, then it there's kind of no value in it. I mean, other than it it looks good on your stats or something, but it, it doesn't get you anywhere in terms of uh, what you're trying to achieve with the blog. But so uh, I I mean, I asked you about uh, the uh, the the kind of the advice that you would give uh, again after having been doing this for for eight years now, getting close to uh, nine years now. Would you recommend doing it at all? I mean, has it been worth it for you? Has it? Are you glad you've done it? Has it has it been beneficial to your career? Uh, and would you recommend that somebody else do it? Um. It's been very good for my career, um, not only because of the of the the ability to display my knowledge um, and the knowledge of our law firm, uh, but also just increase the profile. Uh, you know, we post on LinkedIn, that kind of thing. Uh, so I've got people who not who aren't in the business that are I'm connected with on LinkedIn. Read it, uh, hear it. Uh, some of them blow it off. I'm sure that it that has no interest to them, uh, but it's there. Uh, kind of like, you know, I don't care what you say about me. Just say it, you know, say it often. Um, um, it's it's enjoyable for me. If somebody's going to take on a blog because they feel like they have to and they don't enjoy it, it I suspect it would be misery. <laughs> and they won't keep up with it. Yep. So it, you got to... But the only way you know if you like it is to you got to do it. Got to start doing it, yeah. And if you get yep. caught up, and I, I I have a bunch, and I have a bunch of fun with it. Yeah. So. 
you know, that's that's a benefit, personal that, benefit. That's a great benefit. Um, I've been asking you a lot of questions. Anything else that you wanted to mention uh, about the blog or about your practice or anything else before we wrap up? No, I just think uh, <clears throat> I just think everybody in the oil business ought to read it. <laughs> well, Frequently. that's a given. That that Every goes week. without saying. No, that I, goes without saying. No, I, I just appreciate the time to uh, to chat with you. I really do. Yeah, I appreciate uh, your taking the time to do it. It's been a real pleasure to do it and uh, a real pleasure to get to uh, hear about your blog and and uh, in your career. Uh, so thank you very much. And I hope you stay well and healthy and sane. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, again, we've been talking with Charles Sarton of the Energy and the Law blog, and he's a partner at uh, the law firm Gray Reed in Dallas. And uh, this episode, as I said earlier, and all of them, you can find up at youtube.com slash Lexblog or in at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever else you want. The program uh, is presented by Lexblog on behalf of everybody at Lexblog. Thanks for listening, watching. This is Bob Ambrogi. See you next week.